and so I want to make you guys aware that these pests are out there so that if you see them in uh, your fields that you cover, uh, you'll know what they are and know a little bit about them. Uh, the first one is called Japanese beetle. This is a shiny tan and green beetle, pretty big, as big as my thumbnail. Uh, this is not to be confused, some people call Asian lady beetles, you know, the little um, orangish lady beetles that get into houses and also um, good predators in field crops. Some people think those are Japanese beetles, actually not so. Japanese beetle is this big shiny green and tan guy. And I'm going to pass these around so that you can get a closer look at them. Japanese beetle uh, has not native to this country, but it's actually been in this country since about 1916 or so. And it started out on the East Coast. And over the decades, it has been moving its way slowly westward. This is a, an insect that feeds on uh, leaf tissue of plants, and it is a very broad generalist. It's on over 300 different uh, plants. And as it gets built up here in the Midwest, it's starting to be uh, an occasional pest in corn and soybean both. Uh, we do have it in South Dakota. The South Dakota Department of Ag does a monitoring program for it. So far, it's mostly only been a problem for home gardeners. These things eat a lot of different plants and they'll get into flowers and zinnias and they really love rose bushes. So this is mostly on the radar screen of the home gardener. But they can, in fact, get to economic levels in soybean. And in soybean they feed on the leaves and uh, basically like any chewing insect, just uh, with enough chewing damage, harm the plant that way. And they can also, in corn, they tend to eat the silks of corn. Now, we do uh, have occasional reports that someone has seen it in soybeans. We, I have not yet seen uh, an economic infestation in soybeans, but our neighbors to the south, Nebraska, are having more and more reports of occasional economic Japanese beetle populations in soybean, and also in, in parts of Iowa. And in Illinois, they've been de dealing with this, with this for a number of years. So it's uh, pretty easy to kill once you know it's there, and it tends to be an edge feeder first. You see it showing up on the field margins first as it moves out of uh, shelter belts or woodlots where, it's, where, uh, where it harbors on the winter. So uh, often edge treatments will take care of it if you're scouting and if you notice it. And soybeans, as you're probably aware, can take a fair amount of defoliation before they start having yield loss. General rule of thumb is if it's a pre-bloom, soybeans can tolerate up to 30% defoliation. That's kind of a lot. And any time between a bloom and the end of the season, if it's about 20% defoliation, we recommend you treat. But if you see this uh, pest in your soybean or in your corn, uh, I'd appreciate it if maybe you'd um, let me know, shoot me a line, give me a call, Kelly Tillman in the Plant Science Department because we are interested in documenting whether and when it starts becoming a problem in field crops. The second emerging pest, brown marmorated stink bug. Has anyone heard of brown marmorated? I'm seeing a few heads nodding. This is another invasive insect species, another fairly large insect, uh, bit as big of, as a fingernail. We do have a couple of stink bug species that you may already see in soybean in South Dakota. These are the brown stink bug and the spine soldier bug. The brown stink bug is every once in a while a pest some places, mostly in the south. And we don't really have a problem with it up here. You can find it, not really a problem. It has very pointy shoulders. The spine soldier bug is actually beneficial. It's a predator of other insects. You'll also find that in South Dakota soybean. The way that brown marmorated stink bug is different, has rounded shoulders and very distinctive triangular white patches around the border of the abdomen. Little white notch looking triangles, very distinctive. I'm going to pass these around and tell you a little bit about brown marmorated stink bug. This is an increasingly problematic pest 
of field crops, vegetable crops, fruit crops in the eastern U.S., particularly the Middle Atlantic region. Uh, we, it is a good hitchhiker. It spreads around the country. It gets into cars and travels across the country. We often see the first occurrences in a new state along the interstate. Uh, it has been found, at least individual specimens, not necessarily long-standing established populations, but individuals have been recovered in all the states surrounding South Dakota. And I feel quite confident it's crossed the border into South Dakota. We just uh, don't have as many boots on the ground to record these. But the thing about them is that they're very broad generalist. They'll be in a number of different types of plants. And they also get into houses like crazy in the fall, not unlike Asian lady beetles. And so they're a real domestic nuisance on the East Coast where there's high populations. But they're also a very um, severe pest in, of soybeans in the East U.S. They feed directly on the seeds. They see, feed, feed through the pods onto the seeds and shrivel up the seeds. And they'll do the same thing to corn kernels. So if they've been heavy feeding from stink bug, you'll just have these shriveled up uh, ears or shriveled up uh, seeds in the pods and uh, substantial damage when the populations get going. So this pest is one I'm actually a little bit more concerned about than Japanese beetle. It's too early to say yet, you know, when and how much of a problem we may have, but I'm pretty confident that it's going to make its way in here. It does not seem to be stopped too much by cold weather, unlike some other emerging pests in the south of soybean. Uh, so this is a good one to be on the watch out for as well. When we start seeing it uh, a little bit more commonly in the area, uh, we'll be putting out some control information. Basically anything that will kill brown stink bugs will pretty much kill these. That's the good news. They're pretty easy to kill with uh, registered pesticides that um, are effective against stink bugs, other stink bugs. So any questions about Japanese beetle or brown marmorated stink bug? A lot of people have asked me, are action thresholds different now that soybean values are so much higher? You can still use a, an action threshold of 250 aphids per plant as long as you feel you can get out to treat the fields within, let's say, about four days of making that decision. Uh, world won't end if you use 200 aphids per plant as a trigger point, but there's really not much reason to dip too much below that because at that point you're below the damage boundary and there's a uh, good chance that if you spray too low you'll have to spray again later in the season, uh, in particular because you've knocked out the lady beetles and the other beneficials that might help keep things kind of damp down until later in the season. So. Uh, we really don't recommend insurance treatments for soybean aphid. It actually can cause more problems later on, but that being said, this is a good year to stay vigilant. Any other questions for me? I got a question, Kelly. Yeah, Pete. Uh, as far as drought or moisture, how does that, do you expect that to influence the probability of an aphid outbreak? Or? So if you couldn't hear the question uh, in terms of drought or maybe moisture, how will that affect the probability of a soybean aphid outbreak? They do not like really hot, dry conditions. So I think one of the things that kept things kind of damp down last year was the really, really hot, dry weather that we had. So they, they like best sort of moderate uh, temperatures and moderate conditions. Uh, heavy rains can slow them down. I think it's an actual physical knocking of the aphids off the plant, and that can knock a population back for a little while when we've had very heavy rains. When it's a very, very moist environment, in particular towards the end of August, when we see the highest aphid numbers beginning to build up, that's also when we start getting a lot of dew and a lot of humid conditions under the canopy. And we'll often see outbreaks of fungus, uh, insect killing fung fungus, um, that can crash aphid populations pretty quickly. Uh, the thing that you really have to watch out for in droughty conditions uh, are spider mites. And last year we had a lot of significant problems with spider mites in crops where we don't always see that. So um, definitely hot, dry weather. Don't worry as much about the aphids, worry about the spider mites. Other questions? Yep. So 200 is the count that you recommend action? 
Yeah, 250 to 200. If you feel like it's at 200 and you feel like they're still going up, I'm cool with taking action. Um, really, there's not a lot of point in treating below that because when you're down below that, there's just as good a chance that you're not going to develop a problem. I mean, we've all seen fields where there's just a low number of aphids and they just kind of putter along all season long. So below, I'd say 200, you're probably jumping the gun. If you're at 200 and you feel like, if you're feeling your bones are just trying to increase, then that's a decent decision point. From that point on, you have about five, six days to treat before you actually reach the injury level. So the action threshold or the decision threshold is different from the economic injury level. The injury level is a higher level. Right now with the high price of beans, uh, the injury level is about 475 aphids per plant. That's where the yield drag, the money you're losing from the yield drag, equals the cost of the insecticide treatment. So that's the economic injury level which does float up and down depending on crop values and also treatment costs. So the decision point is not actually the point where you're losing yield. That's the point where you make a decision early enough that you have several days to take care of things before it reaches the actual injury level. So that's an important decision, the distinction to make. A lot of people think, well, I'm losing yield at 250. I don't want to do that. I need to treat back down here at 100. Actually, no, you're treating at 200, 250 so that you are not reaching 475 or 500. We basically can hardly even detect, even with replicated plots, a good number of reps, we can barely even detect measurable yield loss at less than, let's say, 400 aphids per plant. There's just not enough aphids to, to really cause noticeable damage. So that's another reason why we really don't recommend that you jump the gun at low aphid numbers. Great questions.